Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for, for being here, to those who are here and to those who are watching us uh, online. Um, my name is Nuno Cernadas. I'm a pianist and a researcher, PhD candidate here at the conservatory and at the, the VOB. And I'm working on the piano sonatas of Alexander Skriabin. Um, I would like to begin. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about the sixth piano sonata, Opus 62. And I would like to begin by playing you uh, an excerpt from the most significant and large scale of uh, Scriabin's late works, the Prometheus Opus 60, the poem of fire. And on the, on the left uh, panel, So on the left panel, you will see the two piano reduction of, of the piece. And on the little panel on the right, you will see the chord from which all melodic and harmonic uh, content originates. Uh, with this excerpt of the beginning of Prometheus, uh, we can see clearly that this wonderful piece is written by resorting to one kind of harmonic construct, a set of six tones built in quartal structure, which came to be known as the mystic chord. There is this chord that we have here on C in this case. And from which you can unfold the scale. Besides being an extraordinary musical achievement, Prometheus is also a first attempt, attempt at a synthetic multimedia work, as Scriabin included in its orchestral score a part for light organ, which associates to each tonal center a corresponding hue, which in its turn symbolizes an abstract idea or state of being. There is therefore a threefold association, harmony, color and idea. The example you see here is on display at the Skriabin Museum in Moscow and is said to have been designed by the composer itself, himself. Sorry. The mystic chord so prevalent in Prometheus is in fact so uniquely sounding and so representative of Skriabin's idiomatic mysticism that is offered, often considered to be the single harmonic structure present in Scriabin's late post-Promethean music. Although his late music is permeated by the same thick mystic haze by a sense of timelessness and otherworldliness, the supposition of the omniprevalence of the mystic chord 
as I have grown to believe and have tried to demonstrate in our research days, is a mere fallacy. Before I had started to play and carefully analyze the late piano sonatas, I had naively accepted this view, which I had read countless times in program notes. I had therefore based my PhD project on devising a plan to identify the underlying mystic chords present in the post-Promethean piano sonatas and producing a light component by the same principles of harmony to color correlation. Thankfully, and although my initial proposition proved to be heading in a wrong direction, Scriabin's music provided the solution for my initial doctoral ideas to find validity, as I will later explain. When one looks at Scriabin's life and oeuvre, when one considers the total arch of his creations, an organic and constant evolution becomes evident. The steady mutation bridges a tremendous musical chasm between his early highly Chopinesque phase and his final sketches for L'Acte Préalable, in which 12 tone chords can be found. Scriabin's harmonic language evolved constantly with noticeable small developments between works separated by small differences in opus number. A transformation of this magnitude is not explained by schematic and artificial intellectual impositions as to how to write creative and original music, but is instead a product and consequence of a wild independent creative spirit, always daring, always searching, always striving towards a high ideal. The piano sonata number six is a prime example of this ever searching attitude. The somber, dark, and unholy atmosphere of this piece is vividly illustrated in Fabian Bauer's biography of Scriabin. The sixth sonata, opus 62, is another star. Its dark and evil aspects embrace horror, terror, and the omnipresent unknown. Only my music expresses the inexpressible, Scriabin boasted, and called the sixth sweet and harsh harmonies nightmarish, Foliginous, murky, dark and hidden, unclean, mischievous. The Sixth Sonata was completed in 1911, one year after Prometheus, and in contrast to the Fifth Sonata, which draws immensely from the same musical and poetic program as Poem de l'Extase, written at about the same time, the Sixth Sonata has much weaker ties to Prometheus. In fact, their harmonic nature is quite different. Instead of the all-pervasive mystic chord, the sixth sonata uses the octatonic scale as its main building block. Out of the sonata's 386 bars, 227, or 59% of the whole piece, consists of pure octatonic writing, passages which don't include any foreign non-octatonic notes. The octatonic scale, as we know it, is a highly symmetrical construct of eight notes. By alternating a semitone and a whole tone, it creates a symmetry node at every minor third, highlighted in red, which in turn dictates that it will only be able to offer three different collections, three different possible transpositions. The octatonic scale itself was at the time of Scriabin no novelty. It had been used profusely in Russian folk music, also by Rimsky-Korsakov, and had been also used by Liszt, among other composers of the Romantic generation. Messiaen later listed it as the second mode in his mode à transposition limitée. Liszt, for example, uses the octatonic scale in the beginning of his Petrarca sonnet number 104 as a means similar to his use of the diminished seventh of preluding without setting a clear tonality right from the start. why the G-sharp octave, which is highlighted in red, sounds so radiant and especially meaningful, 
is that it is the first non-octatonic note of the piece, the first note to come out to free itself from the octatonic grasp and to lead the way to establishing a feeling of tonal rootedness. Notice also how Liszt, like Scriabin would do later with the sixth sonata, doesn't write any key at the beginning of the piece, only introducing the E major marking on bar five. What in Scriabin's case is quite outstanding is the ability not only to use the octatonic scale for such intricate introduction or transition passages like Liszt, but to create a complete big scale work almost exclusively out of this language with coherent and meaningful motives, themes, progressions, and logical development. The octatonic scale is in many respects a perfect fit for Scriabin. By virtue of its symmetry and consequence, consequent loss of hierarchical and gravitational pull between the notes, characteristics which are inherent to its structure, the octatonic scale makes possible for a kind of musical kaleidoscope, for a weightless and timeless music that fits perfectly with Scriabin's mysticism and his compositional practice of repeating the same elements almost verbatim in transposed forms. The octatonic scale adds a problematic dimension, however, by being symmetrical, by dividing the octave in four equal minor thirds, any kind of hierarchy is removed, any kind of gravitational pull is lost, musical anchoring is rendered impossible. Moreover, the fact that it allows for only three transpositions results in a sound that struggles not to become monotonous. These qualities of the octatonic scale caused a dilemma in my personal case, since my PhD project aimed to identify tonal hierarchies within the Scriabin late sonatas in order to associate colors to them by applying the same synesthetic ideas Scriabin had put forth in Prometheus. But how can one associate colors to tonal centers when there are none, when all of those hearable semitone inflections are nothing, nothing but sides of a symmetrical kaleidoscope? when all different sets can be reduced to three transpositions. These questions, which troubled me for some time, are thankfully answered by Scriabin's music, if one examines it and closely and attentively. Being a scale with eight tones, the octatonic scale is necessarily notated with one repeated pitch, which is then written with different accidentals, which you see here, the E flat and the E natural. The notable aspect here is that Scriabin cons consistently repeats the third pitch of the scale, alluding to the usual orthography of minor major scales. This observation is corroborated by the disposition of supporting chords and bass notes, which more often than not feature the root tone of the scale. By clearly showing us the third and fourth step of the scale, Scriabin transforms a symmetric octatonic collection into an asymmetrical one, endowing it with a tonal hierarchy. This differentiating attitude towards the octatonic allows the performer or analyst to trace the harmonic progressions and overall harmonic movements of the piece to particular keys or reference, to use a better term, even if many of these only differ differ in their abstract spelling and not in the sound being produced or heard. This attitude of clear attention to musical gesture, structure and architecture is one of the more important aspects of the late Scriabin, a genius of both spontaneity and calculation. Since Scriabin's octatonic scales can be identified and traced to one root note, colors can be associated with them as by the composer's indication in Prometheus. Let's now observe the workings of the sixth sonata to see how Scriabin uses the octatonic framework.
there are many relevant elements in this opening sonata theme. Condensed in the lower piano register, Scriabin writes a chord of stacked fifths. These intervals create a kind of detached sound by widening the spaces between the notes and weakening the gravitational pull between them. So the first chord which you can see here. Extraneous to this intervallic logic is the F of the left hand, which is acting as a chordal pivot and replaces the E with which the chord would otherwise be formed. This chordal disposition is responsible for creating the mysterious and strange atmosphere, which is made sinister by the register and menacing by the affirmative mezzo forte initial dynamic. If we combine all of the notes of the first eight bars, we have a full octatonic series on G. Only one tone, an E, is missing from the set. We also have one foreign or passing note, the A of the baritone voice in bars two and five, which are I highlighted with the red arrows, which resolve chromatically to a G. Note that this is no ordinary foreign note, however, but the only tone pertaining to the mystic chord which doesn't belong also to the octatonic scale. An octatonic progression is triggered in bar nine and 10 by melodic intervals of minor thirds and harmonic jumps of a tritone. Only here do we first leave the initial octatonic referent on G. We reach a second thematic area in bar 11, where we have a full octatonic scale in D flat. Notice the F and F flat being simultaneously played in bar 12, highlighted by the arrows, and the passing note E flat, which again is a mystic chord note. These two examples show us how, how octatonicism is the main structure at play with occasional hints and inclusions of the mystic chord note not contained in this set. Another good example of the sonata's architecture is the tumultuous dance of bars 92 to 101. This passage belongs to the sonata's uh, first big span of pure octatonic writing. The dance consists of an, up of an upward octatonic harmonic movement of minor thirds using the 6Z49 set. This set is a six-tone subset of the octatonic scale, which is maximally related with a mystic chord, sharing with it five of its six pitches. It's a bit theoretic uh, explanation, meaning that this set, which is a subtract of the octatonic scale, has five of the six notes of the mystic chord. The sonata scoda, which prolongs the octatonic writing of the recapitulation second and third theme, and thus creates an immense span of 184 bars of pure octatonic writing, offers one more fascinating glimpse into Scriabin's masterly architectural work. On bar 365, in the beginning of a chord cascade supported by a repeated cell in the bass, so here in this place, Scriabin writes a D as the highest note in the first chord. The problem is this note didn't then and does now exist on the piano. So why did Scriabin write it? And mind you, Scriabin was a great pianist. He certainly knew what he was doing. The reasons are again a testament to a structural master plan. By writing the high D, Scriabin adheres to a purely octatonic structure, privileging the coherence and unity of the musical text to the detriment of a hearable result. Had he written a high C instead, the highest possible note on the keyboard, but one which doesn't belong to the octatonic collection on G, Scriabin 
would have allowed for one non-octatonic pitch to intrude into this most pure of octatonic fields. This example gives us a rather rare insight into the intellectual workings of Scriabin and to the intentional degree he attached to structures, relations, and proportions. I would now like to discuss, discuss some aspects which relate to the performance you are about to hear. And I would like first to thank Jin He Zhang for graciously assisting with the triggering and activation of the visual elements, which is not a small feat. As I have previously stated, Scriabin's idiomatic orthography of the octatonic reference allows for an identification of its root tone and consequently for a color to be attributed to each. Thus, we reach the following colors, following Scriabin's Prometheus annotations. C for red and red intense. G, orange. D, yellow. A, green. E, sky blue. B, blue. The referent in F sharp or G flat, bright blue or violet. C sharp or D flat, violet or purple. A flat, violet or lilac. E flat, glint of steel. This is what is written on the score of Prometheus. B flat should be rose and F should be deep red. The question is then, how do we bring these colors to life? How do we instill in them the creativity and mystery so masterly contained in the music? I tried to look for solutions to this most important of questions in the music itself and to let it de determine how the visual component should mani manifest itself. I decided to attribute to each of the sonata's main themes and important motives a visual theme of their own. In doing so, I tried to match what I perceived to be each motif's character concerning the fluidity, movement, gravity, brightness of the music, to use some synesthetic vocabulary, but also to take in close account Scriabin's French annotations, which are incredibly valuable and suggestive. Some themes that I believe are transversal to the whole of the sonata and are unique to the sound world are those of abstraction, kaleidoscope figures, gaseous or fluid dreamlike shapes, and explosive or menacing motives portraying the horror and terror of hidden sinister forces. For the sonata's first theme, I have chosen a kaleidoscopic visual motive given the symmetrical nature of the octatonic scale, but given also the mysterious, strange atmosphere of the beginning. For the second, the sensual movement of an abstract web of lines that intend to portray the activity of the music. For the third, and taking inspiration in Scriabin's annotations Souffle Mystérieux and Onde Caressante, the fluid of a mysterious reflective liquid The fourth, again marked by Scriabin, Le Rêve Prend Forme, a soft moving nubulous shape, indistinct. I won't go into details about all musical motives and their visual counterparts, as I don't want to spoil the simultaneous sonic and visual experience but also because I don't want in any way to direct your attention to certain aspects of the visual motives which would betray my interpretation. Instead, I ask you to let your imagination and creativity guide you, 
guide your critical perception between what you see and hear and to let one influence the other. I believe this process of motivic sonic visual correlations provides an interesting experience, not only at the level of an immediate aesthetic pleasure, depending on the observer's assessment of the suitability and compatibility of the pairings, but also on a structural level, by further emphasizing, now on a visual plane, the sonata's tapestry of motives and their harmonic design. This becomes, in my opinion, particularly interesting in the sonata's development, when the motives are fragmented and superimposed, and also on the coda, which is composed with very rapid turns of repeated blocks of short motivic material, normally two bars each, which succeed each other in a frantic cosmic dance. I hope you enjoy it, and thank you.
Good afternoon. My name is uh, Philippe Lamouris. I'm a composer and a pianist. And today I'm going to talk about uh, the poem of ecstasy of uh, Alexander Scriabin. And um, it's called Le Poème de l'Extase, of course, in French. And um, I will talk about it uh, both from a composer's viewpoint and also a performer's uh, viewpoint. But uh, before going into the piece in, in more detail, I want to explain how I uh, got to know this piece and how important it is in my whole research trajectory. So first, uh, I um, got to know this piece in, um, let's say, 12 years ago when I first heard it, uh, and it blew me away. It was something magical. I, I couldn't find words, but I was really... Uh, it, it was such a surprise, this music, this... Uh, this whole uh, harmony, this, this whole world of Scriabin, that uh, immediately I printed the score and I, I tried to analyze and understand what uh, happened in this uh, work. And uh, of course, as in the student years goes, you look at the harmony, you look at uh, the form and so on, but you do not go as deep, then you go to, on to the next uh, work, which is also very interesting. And uh, then I put it aside for a bit. But it always was there as one of my favorite pieces. And uh, a few years ago, when I started my uh, doctoral uh, research, I uh, had this idea of, okay, what do I want to do with my research? What do I want to become as a composer, as a performer? And it always came to mind as, I want to be able to compose a piece like the Poème de l'Extase. Of course, not in the same harmony of this, the same uh, orchestration, but the, the feeling I got when, when I was listening, or I, even today I'm listening to this piece, uh, is what I want to give the listener with my own music. So then the question arose, how can I do this? Of course, I have to learn the secret of this piece. And uh, then again, you take the score and you start listening and analyzing. And at that time, I even I put it on the piano. I said, I will play it. And uh, of course, after a few pages, when you have such an orchestral score with eight horns and, and five trumpets all transposing, uh, you give up after a very short amount of time, but at least the harmony, you can uh, understand it a bit uh, better. And of course, there is so much written on, on this piece. Um, of course, we already ho heard uh, Nuno talk about the mystic chord and then uh, the octatonic scale. And it was just written before the uh, Promete and um, before the Sixth Sonata. So it's not uh, yet totally in this octatonic and mystic chord uh, feeling or, or theory, but there are already some uh, ideas that you can uh, hear there. And um, so, okay, I, I, I set out a journey to learn the secrets of this piece and then to try to incorporate it into my own artistic practices. So, um, okay, then uh, I... Uh, tried this, I analyzed, I listened to all the recordings. The first recording in nine, of, of first recording that we, we have is, is of 1932. And uh, that recording, and compared to even the recordings of, of today by Boulez or by uh, Petrenko with the Berliner, they are all uh, so special for me. Um, then a few years passed by, and, and last year I played on the same polyphonic performance spaces Another uh, very dear uh, composition, and that's the Rachmaninoff uh, Second Symphony, the adagio of it. And uh, this process, what I had when I studied it and I played it, it was uh, eye-opening. Really playing orchestral music by yourself and not just listening or analyzing, it's, it opens other dimensions. So uh, uh, in the euphoria of uh, this Rachmaninoff performance, I had the idea, I will play the Poème de l'Extase this year also on the polyphonic performance spaces. And I said to my promoter, yeah, fix it, I will do this. And then a few months ago, when I started really learning uh, the piece and I uh, put the orchestral score on my piano and I started, I said, it's not possible. It's, it's too difficult. How can I play such a big orchestra uh, on the piano without really uh, diminishing its value? And then, of course, it was already fixed, so I had to do it, and I had to work my way through this process. So what I've done is I started by 
transcribing it and, and uh, sitting at my computer and I'm at my piano trying to figure out a way how to uh, translate the, the opening few bars into a, a piano version of, of the piece. And uh, it took a lot of time and it took really, uh, I didn't say I, I gave up, but I also then tried to find other directions to approach this. And then I looked at, of course, the two uh, piano version of the score, which is also very difficult and to re reduce that into a uh, solo piano was also not possible. But then I stumbled upon somewhere in the uh, hidden uh, parts of the internet on a, a solo piano reduction, or a, let's say a, a piano transcription by Pavczynski. And uh, when I found this, I said, yes, this is, this I can use, this I can play. And uh, I printed out a score, I started to play it, and the first few pages, it's all uh, very much possible and very nicely done. The whole transcription is, is I think, magnificent. But after some time, I felt also still not 100% happy with how it sounded. I, it was really a transcription. It was a piano version of it. And there were a lot of things missing, but there were also so many elements that you almost do not hear in, a, in an orchestral version of the piece. So I said to myself, okay, I will try to mix my own ideas with the Pavczynski version. And this is what I'm going to play uh, today. And uh, I also thought to myself, okay, is this really a piece that should be played uh, on a big concert hall and as a, as a pianist? And I, I had the idea, no, it's, it's not really a piece for that. It's an orchestral piece. But I wanted to play it because I wanted to feel the same feelings I had when playing this Rachmaninoff last year. So I, I decided to, okay, how would Skriabin have played this piece? As we know, Skriabin was a very good uh, pianist and uh, we have, uh, I'm quite sure that he had his colleagues over when he was uh, composing it and, and played some passages uh, to his friends and, and explained, yes, hear this and I'm doing this and this. So this is the feeling I want to give to you all uh, when uh, playing now this piece. And uh, last year when I uh, did the Rachmaninoff, I stumbled upon a recording of Rachmaninoff himself playing his symphonic da dances to uh, some, of his, some of his friends and colleagues in a homemade recording. And it was fascinating how he is playing them and he's stamping with his foot and he's singing the melody. Now, I'm not going to do this today because otherwise some would accuse me of imitating Glenn Gould or something. Uh, but uh, this really feeling of expressing yourself, uh, trying to imitate an orchestra uh, using this uh, very nice instrument, uh, is a challenge and it's also something that I myself do as a composer when I write my own uh, pieces uh, for orchestra. Then I also show my friends, uh, nowadays you can show it with a MIDI recording of course or with a computer, but it is much uh, better to just sit at the piano and play it for them. It's, it's much more alive. So um, when I have arrived to this uh, idea of, of playing it as a uh, composer, I, of course, uh, had this uh, question, how would Skriabin have played this? And uh, I'm sure we do not have really an answer. We do not have a recording of him. We have, of course, uh, some kind of recordings of his piano pieces, but still orchestral music in, an, in a more intimate setting, you do not know how he would have played this. Um, so what I've then uh, decided to do is um, just play it as, as like I try to imagine that uh, this piece is also mine. Not that I have anything to do with it, but to absorb it and, and, and really look at it from a composer's uh, viewpoint. There are still a few uh, things I want to talk about before uh, playing the piece. Um, and the, the things that I wrote in the abstract is uh, time, tension, and desire. And I will start with time because this whole polyphonic performance uh, space is weak. We already heard a lot about time on, the, on Monday we had the discussion, then uh, Tuesday we had Kathleen who was talking about uh, time. And uh, while studying this, uh, this work, I really uh, understood what time is and the perception of time while playing or while, while practicing uh, this piece. Time just goes by differently when, when playing. I'm quite sure you all musicians know this. Uh, sometimes you listen then to yourself on a recording, oh, I play this so fast, or uh, I didn't even realize. 
But when you're trying to play an orchestra, you also have to uh, play it in a different way. Uh, the recordings that I uh, listened to, some were 17 minutes long, some were 22 minutes long. It's, there are so many different tempi that you can uh, take. And also even in the first, uh, first bars, how do you play this? What's the timing of, of, of this, uh, this first melody? So it's, 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 it's mind-boggling, and, and it's uh, what I really want to, to say and what I wrote down, this is something you should share, is how much fun I had with this. And this is ex it is extremely important to, uh, every time I've sat down and, and uh, practiced this piece, there was something new that, that came uh, across, and um, that's, that's the essence of it, of course, to have fun and to learn from it. And uh, then the second part, tension, is uh, as Nuno also talked about it in already the, um, the previous lecture, is how Scriabin manages with his octatonic scale and then the mystic chord, but he also does it here in this piece uh, using some different tools and different harmonies in building up tension. And this comes from all of his melodies, this first melody, which then comes and resolves. This is not a real resolve. Throughout the piece, the only real moment that you feel, ah, here we arrived, is at the end. And at the end, if you listen to the orchestral version, and I'm, I'm sh I, I sh should suggest everyone to do this, uh, after listening to this, uh, this piano reduction version, to listen to the real thing, because then you will hopefully get the, the whole picture. And um, so this tension just resolves at the end. And uh, if you play it well, and uh, I think if I really uh, play it well, I should fall dead after uh, 10 minutes because the tension builds up and never resolves and goes on and on. And uh, I, I even uh, thought about, okay, normally you have an orchestra of 80 people uh, carrying this burden and this tension, and of course the conductor who, who manages everything, and it's, uh, it's uh, equally divided, this tension, among the 80 people. But now I have to do this all myself and to, uh, to keep it in and then uh, go to the end. So it's, it's in this case, uh, very hard. But this tension is, is, is um, there the whole time. And then we get to the last point, which is desire. And, and uh, Scriabin uh, writes in a lot of his piano pieces uh, about uh, the expression mark desire and uh, with it, uh, play this with desire. And this is also what I hear uh, in this um, piece. So every melody wants to go somewhere. And of course, now you will not hear all of the melodies because sometimes there are five different melodies going uh, through the uh, piece and it's, it's just physically uh, impossible to play them. But while I'm playing them, I, I hear them in my head because I know the orchestral score. Uh, it's not that I can't. Uh, play it, that I, I do not uh, have it in me. So uh, this entanglement and, and these, these voices talking to each other and, and always uh, leading to the next chord, next chord, next chord, is what uh, gives this magic to this piece. Um, we always talk about harmony when uh, looking at Scriabin, and uh, we saw it also with Nuno, but I always ask him then afterwards, and what with the rhythm? Because uh, the rhythm of the orchestral version, it's, uh, it's polyrhythmic, a lot of times different uh, values against each other. And of course, it's very hard to play this uh, at, uh, in, the, in a piano version. But uh, what I learned from this, that the whole piece is the whole time um, trembling. It's, it's like trills and tremolos. And now I get why Gergiev uh, uh, is uh, conducting the whole piece like this. It's, it's like this, and it should be like this. Uh, of course, it's, it's hard to, to imitate this as a at the piano, but now in the composer's version, I've already told you, you, sh you should at least try to imagine everything uh, um, uh, trembling in, this, in the concert hall. And uh, of course, then, uh, this uh, idea of orchestration and these tremolos still emphasizes this tension further, this desire further. Um, then, just to finish, and then I will play it, um, is uh, the part, my question which I had at the beginning. The, I wanted to understand this, this music, I wanted to unravel the mysteries of, of, of Scriabin's poem, De L'Extase, and then use it 
as uh, tools for my own artistic practices. And if somebody would ask me if I've succeeded, then I would say yes and no. Uh, yes, in a way, I feel and I, I know what he wants and I know why I feel those things and what I can, what this music means, but I can't explain it. It's impossible to explain, uh, to put words on it. The moment you put words on it, the magic disappears. He, uh, Scriabin wrote a poem uh, for this poem de l'Extase and also for the fifth uh, sonata. And uh, it's not uh, supposed to be recited or, or read with the performance of this piece, but uh, he, he also tries there to, to express this. But I think the music itself is, is more than enough uh, now that I've fully absorbed it and fully feel it and, and just almost say, be one with the music, how philosophically, philosophically it, uh, it may sound, it's, it's important and that's what I learned from this. And what I would also suggest everyone who, who is interested in, in music is to really dive uh, into it and play it and try to become one as Scriabin in his whole mysticism, of course, it's uh, funny to come back to this point, become one with everything. Uh, so with that note, um, I will now uh, play the whole poem de l'Extase in a piano reduction version.
Good evening to everyone. I am Marco Mantovani, a PhD student at the conservatory, and I will present today a performance with the title On the Path of Hoffman, the Fantastic in Schumann and Bulgakov, The Master and Margarita. The topic might, uh, of my concept might seem unusual and a little strange. What do Schumann and Bulgakov have in common? Why create a link between such different personalities? The first is a German composer from the first half of 19th century. The second, a Russian writer and playwright lived under Stalinist regime. Indeed, it was quite a challenge to explain and justify a relationship that I intuitively felt from the very first moment I encountered Bulgakov's great novel, The Master and Margarita. To, to speak first uh, briefly about the book, it was at first censured by the Russian regime and therefore published almost 30 years after Bulgakov's death in 1940, and it is now considered to be among one of the greatest novels of the last century by some of the most important thinkers, including the Italian poet Eugenio Montale. The book has many different interpretative angles, and we can find at least four different stories. The first, uh, the love story of the master and Margarita, where the master is a writer which, after finishing his masterpiece, the book of Pelate, cannot find a publisher, is panned by critics, and ends up in asylum. And Margarita, a married woman who has fallen in love with the master and is devastating in seeing him going mad. A second layer, the story of Voland, so the story of the misdeeds of the devil, which is called Voland in the book, and his acolytes in Bulgakov's contemporary Moscow. A third layer, the story of Pelate, which is a very deep introspection into the troubles, doubts, and guilt of the Roman procurator after condemning Jesus, called uh, Yeshua Anodzri in the book. And finally, the humoristic detective novel of the Russian secret police trying to solve the crimes produced by Voland and his group and obviously failing to catch them. All these stories intertwine in the most unexpected and brilliant way and lead to a final climax where everything is somehow connected. An apparent disordered chaos that unveils an order where all the stories make contact and influence each other. As we clearly see already from the, the short presentation I just did of the plot, the whole novel can be divided between the most ordinary gray reality, so the landscape of Stalinist Moscow in the 30s, and supernatural, fantastic, at time grotesque elements. These two layers do not represent an, uns an unsolvable dichotomy. On the opposite, they are connected and depending one to the other. This poetic choice closely resembles to Hoffman's Serapiontic principle and in general to Hoffman's predilection, the presentation of a fantastic world which is inseparably intertwined with reality, where the supernatural is part of reality and affects it, and where reality is made even more true and personal by the use of many autobiographical references. This peculiar use and taste for the fantastic element is also extremely familiar to Schumann, who was as well very much influenced by Hoffmann's poetic, to the point that the Fantasiestücke uh, Opus 12, which is the piece I will play, borrow the exact same title from a cycle of novels by the German poet. The Master and Margarita is also considered to be one of the greatest love stories ever written. The tormented love caused by the forced separation of the two lovers, which can be reunited again thanks to a supernatural force, represents the second theme that I can refer to Schumann's Fantasiestücke. Indeed, this piano cycle was drafted in July 1837, towards the end of the long period of separation between Robert and Clara. She was at that time intensively touring Europe with her father, who did not want them to meet or even exchange letters. It was indeed one of Schumann's darkest moments where he wasn't sure anymore about the feelings and engagement of Clara. The heart of the cycle, In der Nacht, reminded Schumann himself of the Greek myth of Hero and Leander. Paradigmatic example of tormented love and predecessor of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, this myth tells the story of two lovers living at the opposite sides of Hellespont Strait. Leander would swim every night to join Hero on the other bank, 
until a stormy night when, tossed by the waves, he loses his way and drowns. The following morning, Hero sees the dead body of Leander on the beach and throws herself from the tower to be with him again in death. During this recital, I will connect to Schumann, therefore, only the love story between the master and Margarita, some fantastic elements from the adventures of the devil in Moscow, and some excerpts from the Book of Pilate, which, as in Bulgakov, will be the gluing element of the whole performance. Wondering about how to put in practice during a live performance this dialogue between Schumann and Bulgakov, I found a Russian TV series that is quite accurate and follows the book very closely. I then selected some video excerpts that will come up as flashes, almost reminiscences. I do not want the music to just accompany or describe the video excerpts. The two mediums are and must stay separated. I did not try then to find programmatic and forced connections. But at the same time, I believe these two artistic works share some common ground and this match might add interesting insights both on the music and on the book. I want indeed to create a dialogue between Schumann and Bulgakov, hoping that this conversation will, will differently enlighten both artworks, leading to unexpected perspectives. Thank you.
Я утверждаю смертный приговор и Ешуа Ганоцри. Тогда было около десяти часов утра. Досточтимый Иван Николаевич.
тьма, пришедшая со Средиземного моря, накрыла ненавидимый прокуратором город. Пропал Ершлаим. Великий город. Как будто не существовал на свете. Thank you.